uh, I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about pets on the internet. Uh, though I have to say, when I was getting my computer science PhD, I never thought I would be the world's foremost expert on virtual cat weddings, but here we are. Uh, more about those later. So I study social networks more broadly. I don't just focus on, focus on the pet market. I look at things like Facebook and Twitter. And I started looking at those in the early to mid-2000s when MySpace was the second biggest social network to Adult Friend Finder. Do not look that up on your computers if you have them. Um, and Adult Friend Finder had 20 million members at that point. Uh, now Facebook has 600 million members. Last time they gave us a number. And these social networks have really transformed the way people interact on the web in general. And as that transformation has been taking place, something that I've heard a lot is that you know, these social networks are fundamentally changing the nature of friendship, that people are replacing these meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with these sort of shallow online interactions. And I've always thought that that was really misguided. Uh, first, I still see lots of people at parties and at bars with their friends. Um, I'm sure there's some sitting, drinking in their living rooms by themselves and chatting online, but that doesn't seem to have gotten rid of all those other social interactions that we do. And really, I think if sites like Facebook are having any change on the way people interact with friendships, it's actually making it better. Uh, Facebook gives us an easier way to coordinate interactions with our friends, and it gives us insights into their lives that we might not normally get, because we get to see all of their social circles and those interactions, not just the ones that we're part of. And in addition to that, it gives us a way to maintain friendships that would otherwise have faded away. So I think lots of us are friends with childhood friends on Facebook who we may not have seen in a decade. But we can maintain those friendships because we see what's going on in their lives and we can comment on it and they can see what's going on with us. And that allows those friendships to persist when otherwise they would probably have faded away. So the question is, what happens when we go from Facebook friends to man's best friend? And it turns out that the social networking revolution has not left pets behind. Um, there's Catster and Dogster, which I'll mostly be talking about today. And these are social networks for cats and dogs. They have profiles and they become friends. Um, between them, they have three million pet profiles on their site. There's also Dogbook and Catbook, which are plugins for Facebook, so you can create profiles for your pets there. There is the aforementioned Hamsterster. Uh, for hamsters and gerbils, guinea pigs are not welcome on that site, in case you are curious. <laughs> Uh, there's Bunspace, which is my space for bunnies, and Goldfish Stir, social networking for your pet fish. Uh, and all of these sites basically look the same. They have what looks a lot like a traditional social, social networking interface. Uh, this is my dog, Pi, and it's her profile on Dogster. And you can see there's a profile picture and some other photos. There's some personal information, like her astrological sign, which they computed for me. I didn't put that up there. But she's an Aquarius, if you're curious. Uh, some personality traits, her favorite foods and things to do. And you can see down here that we also have her family members. Those are pet profiles created by the same human user, though humans don't have accounts or pro profiles on these sites. And then we have her pup pals, which is the Facebook equivalent of friends. Uh, they have this also on Catster, but they're called feline friends there. And this is just making your dog friends with somebody else's dog on the social networking website. In addition to just having these profiles, there's also a really lively and active forum and discussion section where people can talk about anything related to their pets. But it has this curious side effect. Because humans don't have profiles on the site, they have to post from one of their pet's profiles. And for some reason, this means to a lot of people that they must post in their pet's voice. So if you had a birthday party for your pet, you wouldn't say, I had Fluffy's birthday party. You would say, oh my gosh, my birthday party yesterday was so great, and you should see all the new toys and treats that I got. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of that later on. So when I got interested in these sites, not just as a user, but as a social network researcher, I was curious about how they might support the different needs of different users. And in particular, I decided to look at a comparison between dog owners and cat owners. Um, if you didn't know I was a dog person, this slide probably gives it away. Um, <laughs> if we didn't know it intuitively, dog people and cat people are very different. And science has told us as much, all the way down to the level of personality traits, dog people and cat people are different. 
And the relationships we have with our pets, if they're a dog or a cat, have to be very different because they're different creatures. So I was curious about whether or not this would manifest itself in the way people are using the sites, and it turns out that it does. Uh, dog people tend to use the sites a lot for support and advice. So this will include things like questions about training, feeding, medical conditions. Um, you know, if your dog is sick or behavior, behavior is strange, you can ask people and get some help and advice there. The dog owners are far more active in that section of the site. In terms of the social networking part, creating friends, they do it far less than the cat owners. The cat owners tend to have twice as many friends for their pet cats as the dog owners do. Um, and in addition to that, while they do definitely, yeah, you like that one? <laughs> while they definitely partake in the advice sections, they're really active in the section of the site called social fun and virtual playdates. And when I first saw that, I, I mean, I haven't used this section of the site, and I'm like, what the heck is a virtual play date? Um, so here's one of those aforementioned cat weddings. Um, you can read some of the text. These are invitations to the wedding and the reception for one particular cat couple. So the way a cat wedding works is that two people will decide that their cat should get married. They will set a date and a time, and they'll start a thread on the forum about this, and people will come in and they'll pick out wedding gowns, decide which cats get to be in the bridal party, they'll pick out dresses and tuxedos for the bridal party, uh, make all of the plans, food for the reception, and then on the date of the wedding, and you can see it says, catster time in the forums, everyone comes to the forums, and they do role playing in the voice of their cats for the whole process of the wedding ceremony and reception. Um, there's about three to 5,000 posts on each of the threads for a different cat wedding. So it's not like a couple people who think this is a good idea. It's a big thing that goes on in these forums. Now, the dog owners are not totally exempt from this. Um, I haven't run into any dog weddings, though I haven't looked too far. Uh, but they do virtual play dates where someone says, here, this is a description of my house, bring your dogs over, and they do role playing in the voice of their dogs um, for what a play date would look like. Uh, kind of silly, right? And I, I bring it up and I show you this text because it's ridiculous, right? You're making an invitation for your cat's wedding online. Um, but it turns out if you step back a little bit from the silliness, that there are some common threads that even though dog and cat people do use the sites differently, the support element of these sites turns out to be incredibly important um, when it comes to issues like health questions or training or just general advice there's a really strong and helpful community of people there who are willing to give advice. And for those of you who are pet owners and have lost a pet, um, you, know, you know how terrible that is and it, how terrible it is even to hear about somebody else going through that. And obviously in a community with three million pets, um, a lot of people are losing pets or um, either they just run away and get lost or they die. And the section of the site dedicated to support for that has some really moving interactions that happen where you'll get these heartbroken posts from people and a lot of really meaningful and in-depth support from the rest of the community to help people move through that. So the community participating in this, whether it's in the silly ways that I mentioned before um, or whether it's through these help, advice, and support sections, brings a lot to people because it allows them to participate in a community of people who have a similar passion about their pet ownership. Uh, but pets are different than other passions, right? They're not the same as a sports team that you like or a kind of model that you like to build in your basement. Pets are actually incredibly impactful on our lives. So these are the results of an amazing study that was done at the University of Maryland hospitals in the 1970s. And they were interested in the survivability rates of cardiac patients who had had open heart surgery and the relationship to social factors. So they sent home surveys that were mostly about things like marital status and the number of friends and how lonely you were. But it included a question about pets. And it turns out that they got these results that among people who owned pets, there was a very, very low death rate after a year. But among people who were not pet owners, over a quarter of them had passed away after a year. And the initial hypothesis was, well, maybe it's because the pet owners are actually dog owners and they have to walk the dogs and so they're getting more exercise and that actually helps them, right? That's why they're surviving. And it turns out if you take the dog owners out of this equation, so you're just looking at a chart of people who own cats, birds, and fish, 
it looks exactly the same. You have one death out of a very large population of pet owners. And this study has been repeated over and over since the 70s in different hospitals in different countries, and the results always come out about the same, that owning a pet really increases your survival chances of serious diseases. And this is just one result in this whole space of research on the human-animal bond that shows remarkable physiological and psychological benefits of pet ownership in any kind of pet. Um, if you've been to a dentist's office where there's an aquarium, a lot of dentist's offices have aquariums, it's because watching the fish calms you down. <laughs> Fake fish won't work, but real fish work. Um, it turns out that people who have pets have lower blood pressure, lower heart rates. There's some studies that even show it might help lower your cholesterol. Um, people with pets recover more quickly from stressful situations. If there's a pet present, people perform better in their jobs or on tests. Um, so there's all of these really important life benefits that have been shown scientifically to come from either just having a pet in the room or having one in your life. And again, if we didn't know this intuitively, science has also shown us that pets increase happiness. And it's probably that happiness that leads to all those other benefits that I had on the previous slide. So if we try to bring this around a little bit to the Facebook discussion that I had at the beginning, Facebook is really a tool that I see as augmenting our social lives. Uh, it doesn't replace those friendships. It gives us new insights and new ways to maintain our friendships that we didn't have before. Now, that's a little bit different in the pet environment because our pets don't really know what we're doing with their social networking profile, and frankly, they probably don't want to. Um, but there are a lot of benefits that indirectly can affect our relationship with our pets. Dog owners use the sites differently than cat owners, and my hypothesis behind that is that you know, dog owners have a lot of opportunities for offline interaction with other dog owners, right? You walk your dog and you run into other people walking their dog, or you go to the dog park, and you can interact with people that way. Cat owners don't have that opportunity. There's not cat parks, and most people don't take their cats out for walks. And so this has become a place for virtual interactions, both through making your fr cat friends with other cats and through these virtual play dates where cat owners can participate in a community with other cat owners in that role as someone who owns a cat. Um, but even beyond that, being part of a community of people who share that passion that can support you in your role as a pet owner is both just great as a pet owner, but it also translates to letting you take better care of your pet, right? Getting advice, even if people are just telling you you really have to go to the vet, allows you to be a better caretaker and that, in turn, enhances your relationship with your pet. So not only is it an easier job for you, but it makes it easier for you to reap all of those benefits that come from the increased happiness and everything that flows from our pets like that. So even though the social networking part of pets is different than the social networking part of humans, it's sort of a continuation of how this type of interaction in communities online is really transforming the way that people interact and get support and maintain friendships both with people that they've never met, with their friends, and with their beloved companions. Thanks. Thank you. Great talk, Jen. Thanks. I have two questions. Okay. First one is, Maybe it was obvious to other people. My obvious question was, are any of these cat weddings actually consummated? Is this a breeding program? Oh. <laughs> so I don't know, okay. <laughs> thankfully. Uh, though it, it turns out most of the friendships and interactions on here have no relationship to real life. Where, you know, before like when MySpace was becoming big, people would, I don't know if any of you remember this, you'd make friends with anybody, right? Friend request approve and you wanted to get as many as possible. We humans have sort of evolved away from that, um, but not here, uh, okay. so. Second question has to do with your other research. When I first heard you speak on your research, it was about social media in Congress. That's right. So I'm wondering if you learned anything regarding <laughs> pet networks that illuminates what's going on in Congress. Oh, I have to be really careful with this one. Uh, so th there are some similarities uh, on kind of a base level. Uh, so the research that we did in Congress and on government use of social media was looking really at how much, how much of the information you're getting through those channels is outreach, or you might call it propaganda, 
uh, versus people actually giving you useful information that you need, right? What you want to hear as opposed to what they want you to hear. Thank you.